All right, everyone, time for more tricky parts of calculus. This message is for instructors. You can't use Euler's identity to prove the angle sum identities for sine and cosine in a calculus class. That's gross pedagogical malpractice in my book. You're using theory that your students don't know, and your proof is circular. What am I talking about? Well, in the first episode, I promised a discussion of the angle sum identities for sine and cosine with the most natural definitions of these functions as parametrizing the unit circle by arc length the angle sum identities sine x plus y equals sine x cosine y plus sine y cos x and cosine x plus y equals cos x cos y minus sine x sine y played an important role when computing the derivatives of sine and cosine from the limit quotient definition these identities are not hard to prove using elementary geometry, and frankly, they're not too hard to remember, especially if you use them a lot. I'm going to give a couple of legitimate proofs of the identities in this video, but for some reason, these identities are rarely derived in a satisfactory way. I can't tell you how many times I have seen calculus instructors and YouTube lecturers purport to derive the angle sum identities for sine and cosine by using the famous Euler's identity and properties of the exponential. Here, I'll show you how the derivation works, but keep in mind I don't consider this to be a legitimate proof of the angle sum identities. They start from Euler's identity, e to the ix equals cosine x plus i sine x, an identity of complex functions. We're interested only in x being real. If you take e to the i x plus y, that's cosine x plus y plus i sine x plus y. But the exponential function also satisfies e to the i x plus y equals e to the i x times e to the i y. And using the identity, collecting real and imaginary parts and comparing to the first expression gives the angle sum identities. So this proof is true, and it's a very efficient way to remember these identities, but it's a completely illegitimate way of establishing these identities for the first time. Anyone who presents the angle sum identities in this way to a calculus class is not thinking carefully about what it takes to establish the Euler identity they're making use of. So let's discuss what goes into a proof of Euler's identity. I don't want to go through all the details, but I want to make clear all of the steps. The most common proof of Euler's identity begins by extending the exponential function to complex arguments by defining x of z equals sum from n equals 0 to infinity, z to the n over n factorial, which is the ordinary Taylor series for the real function e to the x. I'm going to talk about e to the x in a later episode. For now, I'm just assuming you're familiar with e to the x. You show that this series defines a function, which is holomorphic on all of c, that means complex differentiable, uh, using the ratio test. Uh, this establishes an infinite radius of convergence, so the series converges absolutely everywhere. Then you can establish the key property x of z plus w equals x of z x of w for all complex z and w by formal algebraic manipulation of the two series, checking that the series match term by term. A key point not usually emphasized when students first encounter such series in a second semester of calculus is that this formal identity, which involves rearrangement of the terms of the series, is justified at the level of functions converging to the same number and not just as formal power series by the absolute convergence of the series, though this doesn't hold in general for a conditionally convergent series. Now, if you plug in a purely imaginary argument into the exponential series and collect the real and imaginary terms, again, this rearrangement is justified by absolute convergence of the exponential series, you'll notice that the real part is the Taylor series of cosine centered at zero, and the imaginary part is the Taylor series of sine centered at zero. This is indeed how Euler first came upon this identity. A point which tends to get lost in a student's first encounter with power series and Taylor series is that although convergence of these series has already been established, it's a different theorem to show that these series actually agree with the sine and cosine functions on all of R. This is done by bounding the remainder term by the Lagrange error estimate. This is a result based on the mean value theorem and showing that the error goes to zero. 
This should be done for the exponential function as well to argue that it really gives the same as e to the x for real x. Once all of this has been done, now you have Euler's identity, and it's from the properties of sine and cosine that you know that x of ix lies on the unit circle in the complex plane, and this function x is 2 pi i periodic. The moral is that there's a lot to do to establish this identity, none of which can be expected of the student just learning the theory of the trig functions. But the real trouble is that identifying the Taylor series of sine and cosine depends on knowing their derivatives at x equals zero, and computing the derivatives requires the angle sum identity, at least if you define the trig functions in the natural way, like I did. This makes the whole derivation circular. Now, is it absolutely required to use the angle sum identities to prove Euler's identity? This question really gets into the weeds of choices about how these functions are defined. So this is not something students usually think about, but it's enormously important for lecturers. There are other ways to define the complex exponential, either as the solution in C of its differential equation, or as the limit that defines continuously compounded interest, or you can even try defining it as the inverse to the multi-valued complex logarithm, all these definitions require more difficult theory to establish the properties of the exponential, and in all cases you'll need the derivatives of sine and cosine to establish Euler's identity, and the way we define sine and cosine, you need the angle sum identities to compute the derivatives. If one simply took the Taylor series as the definitions of sine and cosine, it seems like you could get around needing the angle sum identities to prove Euler's identity, but that comes at the cost of having to work to establish the geometric meaning of these functions, including, for example, the periodicity of these functions, which does require establishing the angle sum identities. As I described in the first episode of this series, Spivak's calculus text gives a different, unconventional presentation of the trig functions. Their definitions as inverse to areas of sectors is a standard variation on defining in terms of arc length, but because he waits until he's already proved the fundamental theorem of calculus and the inverse function theorem, he's able to take derivatives of sine and cosine without the angle sum identities. So technically I suppose that using Spivak's presentation, one could derive Euler's formula before the angle sum identities. But really, is this what the instructors who use Euler's formula think, that their students have seen this kind of presentation and are familiar with all the theory to prove Euler's identity? Of course not. They're just being lazy, not thinking through how theorems can be established from where their students are actually starting. The bottom line is that using Euler's identity may be a good way to remember the addition formulas, for those who know enough theory to establish the identity, but it's a dishonest and circular proof. The honest, non-circular way to establish the angle sum identities is to use elementary geometry of triangles. It's not calculus at all. Here's a very nice proof that comes right out of the appendices of Stewart's calculus. You just compute the length of the chord AB in two ways. First is the hypotenuse of the magenta triangle, which gives an expression in terms of the sines and cosines of x and y. And it has another expression as the base of the isosceles turquoise triangle in terms of cosine of x minus y by a theorem called the law of cosines. Equating the two expressions gives the cosine angle difference identity. For convenience, I'll even throw in a proof of the law of cosines. It's just an extension of the Pythagorean theorem that works for any triangle, not just a right triangle, which says that c squared equals a squared plus b squared minus 2ab cosine c, the capital C being the angle opposite side little c. You just drop an altitude and use the right triangle definitions of sine and cosine and the Pythagorean theorem. Done. So you have the difference formula for cosine, but I'll note that you immediately get the angle addition formula since cosine is even and sine is odd. And then to get the formulas for the sine, you use that the sine and cosine are reflections of each other over the line y equals x. So sine of pi over 2 minus x equals cosine x, 
and cosine pi over 2 minus x equals sine x. And plugging this in, it all works out. Now, I thought it might be interesting to give what may be the original proof of these angle sum identities from a time when people did not use trig functions like we use them today. This theorem is called the law of the broken chord due to Archimedes, the hero of the first several episodes of this series, or at least it's attributed to him by the 11th century Persian mathematician Al-Biruni. The theorem says that if you have two chords AB and BC inscribed in a circle with BC longer than AB, and if you take midpoint M along the arc ABC and drop a perpendicular MF to BC, then AB plus BF equals FC. The proof is more involved without trigonometry. I'll just give the proof. Take point E on BC so that EC is the same length as AB. Now angle BAM and BCM are the same since they're inscribed on the circle in the same arc. And also AM equals CM since the two chords lie on equal arcs by the definition of M as the midpoint. And that tells you that triangles BAM and ECM are congruent. Well, that means that BM equals ME. So BFM and EFM are two right triangles with two equal sides, so they're congruent and BF equals FE, and therefore AB plus BF equals FE plus EC. Done. This statement is actually equivalent to the angle difference formula for the sine. So I'll leave a reference in the description if you want to see how it's the same. Also, you can look up what's called Ptolemy's theorem on quadrilaterals inscribed in a circle, which also gives the angle sum identities. There are other ways to prove the angle addition formulas. If you're willing to develop the theory of rotations of the plane and believe that rotation by theta and then phi is rotation by theta plus phi, and you establish that these transformations are linear and so can be represented by matrices whose columns give the images of the standard unit basis vectors and whose composition is given by matrix multiplication, then you get your angle addition formulas right from there. This theory is usually treated in a linear algebra class and is probably overkill for establishing the properties of trig functions. I'll also remind viewers that in episode one of this series, in my discussion of Spivak's approach to the trig functions, having established the derivatives of sine and cosine without the angle sum identities, it is possible to prove the angle sum identities by taking derivatives of f of x equals cosine of x plus y, thinking of y as fixed, to find that f solves the differential equation f double prime plus f equals zero, with initial conditions f of zero equals cosine of y, f prime of zero equals minus sine of y. And if you already know the theory of differential equations of this type, which is highly unlikely for a calculus student, you can see that the solution is a linear combination uh, given by cosine y cosine x minus sine y sine x, and similarly for the sine. For someone familiar with ordinary differential equations, this gives a mnemonic device for remembering the angle sum identities that's just as good as Euler's formula or matrix multiplication. So those are proofs of the angle addition formulas. I'll add uh, that in a calculus context, the primary importance of these formulas is to compute the derivatives of sine and cosine, but historically these formulas were critical for the making of accurate trigonometric tables. Such tables were crucial for civilization, which depended on accurate astronomy to understand the length of a solar year on which the agricultural calendar depended. The banner on my channel page is taken from a 3,800-year-old cuneiform tablet which contains a kind of trigonometric table, a rational trigonometric table based on Pythagorean triples. But the first modern trig tables were made by Hipparchus, his table is now lost, and Ptolemy. These ancient astronomers did not work with the sine, but with the chord length that subtends an arc, but that's equivalent to making a sine table. They use theorems equivalent to the angle addition formulas and also the half angle formulas, which follow from the double angle formulas. Of course, the half angle formula in some form must have been known to Archimedes, uh, 
perhaps 400 years earlier, because that's what he used to find the perimeters of regular polygons in order to estimate pi. That should give you some alternatives to reliance on Euler's identity to prove or recall the angle sum identities, which are much older than Euler's identity. Thanks so much for watching. Let me know in the comments if you've also seen lectures prove the angle sum identities from Euler's identity. Let's call them out and stop this terrible practice.